I'm Cheryl Meyer, and this, and I'm otherwise known as Cheryl M. Healthviews. And what my goal is, is to inspire you to lead a healthier lives. So when I proposed my podcast, I proposed that we present it in two different segments. The first one is It Feels Good to Feel Good, Future Proof Your Health, where I get to share everything I have learned to return my health back to relative wellness and to live a pain-free life in spite of the fact that I have autoimmune disease. But the second part of my podcast is this episode, and that's Tell Me Your Story The Health Views Is In. My concept for this is it's all fine and well that you hear me tell my story, but I get a lot of it's all fine and well that it worked for you, but it's not going to work for me. And I wanted you to hear that there are lots of people out there that have made changes in their lifestyle that have supported their health and brought them back to relative wellness. We all have a couple things in common. We all owned our own health. Whatever the doctor was suggesting we did was going on on a parallel path to us making these lifestyle changes where we did things that cleaned up our toxic load. We all pay attention to our body. You'll hear jazz in the background because I want you to listen to the rhythm of your health and I want you to pay attention to what your body is telling you. My body had been trying to tell me that I was going to topple over into toxic load for some time. I just wasn't listening. So if you clean up your lifestyle and if you listen to your body, you have a very good chance not of being deprived in any way, but returning to feeling darn good. And that's what these podcasts are really all about. So thank you for joining me. This is going to be a Tell Me Your Story, The Health Needs Is In episode. And I hope you enjoy it. And I hope that we all inspire you to lead a healthier, happier life. Thank you. Welcome to another episode of Tell Me Your Story. I have a different kind of guest than what I have been showcasing, but he is very knowledgeable about health. He's become an internet friend of mine and has been supportive of my own work. And I am really delighted to showcase him today so that you can hear all about his work and ends up after reading his book, I didn't really understand what a naturopath was. So this is an opportunity for you to learn from one of the best. Dan Young is known all over the United States and he is teaching other naturopaths how to be an effective healer in his modality. And so that's why he's here and I can't be more delighted. Welcome, Dan. Cheryl, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate our relationship so much and the work that we get to do collaboratively together is just amazing. So we sort of are two pieces of the puzzle that fit together because I am a health coach, so I am only about lifestyle change. Um, but Dan is all about how you can supplement your health so that you can go to maximum health by giving your body all the things that you're not getting from what you're eating and what you're doing. And that is, you know, I want you to eat the rainbow, but with what's going on with our farming right now, you're not necessarily getting all the nutrients that you need from the earth like we were when I was a child. I'm an old yes. broad. I used to get lots more from my food than you guys are getting. And so That's it's right. important to know. You start with eating all the colors of the rainbow. But yes. from there, you could still be out of balance. So the first question I wanted to ask Dr. Dan is what a naturopath is so that you have a foundation for our conversation. Naturopaths are typically trained in a variety of modalities that come together. For example, my traditional uh, foundation for, for, for book learning, for, for instructional learning uh, to get uh, the basics in place covered about 10 different certifications between reflexology, homeopathy. Um, we used a massage therapy, herbal remedy uh, use and preparation, homeopathics. So there's a variety of things that I was exposed to 20 plus years ago as I started my, my learning side of the career. Um, and, and a traditional naturopath basically 
is not influenced by modern medicine's approach of diagnosing a symptom that you have a drug or scalpel deficiency. Okay, that's, that is not in our, our wheelhouse at all. We believe very strongly, and if anyone in your audience believes this, then they're in the right place, that you do not have to be harmed in order to be healed in any way. Not even Amen. breaking, not even, not even, you know, some people take it so far in pristine that you don't even uh, break the skin to take blood, okay, as a naturopath, right? So there's, there's, there's a philosophy growing out there, unfortunately, where they're trying to adopt naturopathic tendencies and then be looked at as a primary care physician for insurance purposes, okay? And there's a big movement on that right now and has been for a number of years. Uh, and I don't, I don't blame their approach because they're trying to speak more to their audience with a language the audience understands. The problem is the outcome, the behavior, the results is still leaning them more towards a modern medical approach rather than a non-invasive uh, approach for healing. And so traditional uh, naturopathic uh, tendencies, uh, the foundation of that uh, has a long, rich history. Uh, I'm trying to preserve it. I'm a second generation uh, practitioner in my family, and, and we're doing our very best to preserve uh, the integrity of that approach for people's choices, right? We, I, they can choose a more medically driven, I want to be able to do, you know, uh, prescriptions and scalpels and things like that when it's necessary, right? There's times when that's Well, necessary. and there are times when we need our regular doctors. I call them 100%. conventional doctors, but that's allopathic medicine. We need the them. 100%. But 80% of what they've been positioned to try and help people correct doesn't work. We don't have a drug deficiency or a scalpel deficiency when we have a headache or maybe a bit of a high blood pressure tendency or insomnia or allergies or all these things. These are symptoms of the problem. And it started in this country about 50, 55 years ago where they started training out of the modern medical doctor. Their, their training started to less and less include interpretation of what is this body trying to tell me? Uh, chronic non, you know, a non-resolving recurrent ulcers is a pituitary problem. They don't know that anymore. Okay, they don't know that they think that if we just coat the stomach, we just coat this right here, that this is the problem. And the reality of it is, is that the cases that we've been fortunate enough to work on, you take care of the pituitary, take care of the endocrine system, get it back in harmony, balance, detoxified, which is mm -hmm. your wheelhouse for sure, right. uh, but also well nourished and cared for that it will restore, rebuild and repair and you'll take care of those kind of things. So the philosophy has been shifted, right? in that a traditional naturopath is not someone who is going to be in a position to be typically a primary care physician because they don't have prescribing rights. And we typically don't work with insurance. The upside for that with the consumer is we're not limited by what we can suggest. We, we can tell them to explore a variety of things outside the scope of being covered by insurance. And that way we don't uh, we don't get insurance and cover uh, get in trouble with the insurance companies okay most people don't realize we have an insurance driven quality of care in america it's yeah, they dictate they, they dictate. tell the doctors what they can and cannot do yep and it has the, nothing and to do with what you need i have gone so far as to say publicly that the only reason people go to hospitals is for one of two reasons and we have to think about this and this might sound a little brash but it will get your audience thinking, okay? Right. There's only two reasons people go to hospitals, to get stable or to die, okay? They don't leave there with a wellness plan. They don't leave there with a, a Cheryl Meyer book, How to Live Toxin-Free, right? They don't right. live there with a 6211 rainbow plan on diet or understanding the importance of going having two to three bowel movements every day. They don't leave there with a wellness plan. They either went there and got stable or they passed away. Okay. Not only that, but it is unlikely that their doctor even knows what to recommend that would bring them wellness. If you've ever gone to the doctor and he said, you need to lose weight and you go, okay, how do I do that? He doesn't have a clue. He has nope. not learned that in medical school. So right. we're looking to them as our who said of the greatest magnitude, but they only got the drug side of their education and right. they're their pharmaceutical rep 
is their main source of information. So if you think you're going to get holistic health information from most conventional doctors, it's simply not going to happen because they never learned that. And that's not what they're there to do. Functional medicine is a little bit different. My doctor will do Ayurvedic or holistic first. Mm -hmm. And then if it doesn't work, then we'll uh, explore medications. But she, we always try the um, herbal or the holistic approach. And yes. my body is so much happier. And I have something called MTHFR, which means what goes in my body stays in my body. That's why I got so fascinated with toxins. So I don't want to be putting extra pharmaceuticals into my body because my body's going to react hostily to most of them. So I'd yeah. much rather do the holistic approach first. Yeah. And that's your whole approach, really. Most most people need to understand you know, from a language perspective, why do we have the system we have? Let's take a look at our foundation first. In 1910, Abraham Flexner, an educator, not a scientist and not a doctor, an educator by profession, traveled the country, took two years to do it, released the Flexner Report in 1912. It's 326 pages. It's a boring read, but in essence, I'll give you the... I'll give you the, the, the summary. He was able to go around to all of the schools at that time, and if their teaching did not align itself with the American Medical Association, who was trying to become in prominence at that time, then they either lost their accreditation funding or both, okay? So there's two ways to have the tallest building in town. Either you focus on your building and you get really good at building your building in your town, or you run around and tear everyone else's down. Well, now here we are 110 years later, 108 years later, after the release of that, we're three, almost four generations away from that. And we have generations of people coming up right now who have no clue of the historical irrelevance of the modern medical philosophy in that you either have a drug deficiency or a scalpel deficiency, and it's not healthcare, it's disease management. Let's call it what it really is. And so when we start communicating with the right language that's riddled with truth, then people can start getting the right behavior. And the right behavior and outcome for them is they seek out people like you. They seek out people like me. We collaborate. We get them re-educated, right? And right. something that they know is the truth. And then they can take responsibility. I love what you said earlier about responsibility for their, their own health. And then in very minute occasions, the need for a primary care prescribing physician that can either suggest a surgeon or prescribe a medication is minimal, is minimal. But when there's no an idea that there's competition in the marketplace, a free market society, which we still have uh, as of today, we still have, right? Yep. A free market society where people can take some responsibility, become educated, collaborate with other people who have experience this is not new. There's 6,000 years of recorded history surrounding what you and I are engaged with, with clients, okay? There's only a 110-year history of modern medicine, and that's where traditional care and modern medicine, we can still collaborate. We can work together. Oh, yeah. Well. Actually, they all three could fit together. What I do, what you do, and what allopathic conventional doctors and do. And we would have a much healthier nation if we would look at it that way. But there's so much, there's a pattern, there's a, there's a bad habit that's developed in our nation. We've, we've seen it real clearly the last year or so uh, of, dis, of, 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 uh, of breaking apart, right? Of, of, of not being united on things. Every issue has to have, uh, you know, some kind of division taking place. And that's, that's not healthy, not healthy at all for any of us on any level. No. Now more than ever, we need to come together. We need to collaborate. We need to have a conversation. We need to present the information and let people make informed, well-informed, consensual decisions. And Did I want to encourage one medical... everyone to do their own research. If your yes. doctor has prescribed a pill, go yes. home and research it and then go back. Yes. I'm not saying you don't need him. I'm not saying you don't need the pill. I'm saying you need to be aware of what that pill is going to do to you. And then go back and have a robust conversation with them where you're educated. And they're not going to like that. Nope. Uh, my mother's doctor at one point looked at me and said, who the heck's the doctor here? I said, <laughs> well, who the heck's the daughter? I said, exactly. humor me. Humor me and try what I'm asking. And yes. guess what? I was right. 
and he yep. turned white as a ghost. <laughs> yep, yep. So, but when my mother passed away, he called me and said, I wish everybody had a daughter like you. Wow. Because we were actively concerned together with the health of your mother. So don't be afraid. My mother would go, why are you doing that? You don't yep. tell him everything. I said, well, yep. why not? We're talking about your health. We yes. have to talk about everything. So don't be afraid to challenge your doctor, yes. but do it from a point of knowledge. Yes. There's, there's, and it's really not, it's not a challenge. It's the desire to be informed, to have informed consent. The number one medical ethic taught in medical schools is informed consent, informed choice. But most doctors have forgot that there's three components to that. I, as your patient, okay, have the right to know the risks, the benefits, and the alternatives. Now, if you don't know of the alternatives, then you haven't done your research, doctor, and using fear to just say, well, if you don't do this, worse things are gonna happen, that is called coercion to get somebody to do something that they don't wanna do out of fear of being punished for it. So, so they're using, instead of, of adhering to their number one medical ethic, it seems, not all, okay, but it seems, there's evidence of using fear as the tool rather than quality education as the and, tool. And they, they have too many patients. So yes. they, they have too many patients, they're overworked. They can't possibly know everything, which is why their pharmaceutical rep has become the main source of information. Right. And they are not in your body. You're yeah. in your body. So they don't really have a clue how you feel. They listen for the first thing that you say, and then down the chute comes the peel, the pill, and you are out of their office in six minutes or less. So they can't possibly have explored all the possibilities with you. No. And they may, they probably don't even know what they all are. It doesn't That's mean right. that pill is bad. It just means you have to own you. Yes. Um, and when I got autoimmune disease, my doctor looked at me and said, you need mental therapy. There's nothing wrong with you. I looked at her and said, you're nuts. I know my body and I, there is something wrong with me and I'm going to prove it and I'm going to go find it, which is yep. what made me start to research toxins. Sure, sure. So, you know, these are all things, I'm not saying you shouldn't have a conventional doctor, you should, right. but right. you should also look into what the alternatives are. And it can start with food and supplementation without the horrible side effects from pharmaceuticals. Yeah, it's, it's just a tragic commentary that people have, you know, very willingly, and I understand it because it's the educational model. If right. the only model that's out there, I mean, there's signs up in Cheyenne, the little, you know, the great big digital billboards. Hey, get your community immunity. Get the flu shot today, right? Well, that in itself is another is another area of, of, of discussion. And then what happens is because there's this habit of division in our country, you, well, you're an anti-vaxxer or you're a pro-vaxxer. No, I'm an informed consent advocate know what's in there, know the risks, know the benefits, know the alternatives. And if you want to make the choice to have a vaccine, be my guest. But if you don't, you, you, once you investigate all that, you'll realize that, you know, most people don't really want what's in those things. And the long we, is we are not all the same. Our bodies yeah. all work differently. Yes. Um, I'm even... That. I don't know this to be true. I have not studied it and I'm not a scientist, but I bet you a lot of the children that react hostily to vaccines have something similar to I do with the anomaly in my genes called MTHFR because it goes in and then it can't get out of their bodies and it causes havoc. And yet yeah. in California, you don't have a choice as to whether or not you give that child that vaccine or not. Right, but, <coughs> but what's been perpetuated, there's only four states in the entire country. There's only four in the country that do have statutes on the book, on the books regarding mandated vaccines, okay? Mm -hmm. And people get bullied into not fighting them, okay? They cannot take away your religious exemptions. They can't, it's an impossibility. Some of the ingredients in these things are an abomination to anybody. That's called cannibalism. It's cannibalism, whether you eat it or it's injected. You've just cannibalized human parts that have been donated by aborted fe fe uh, fetuses. So in, some, in, in a lot of cases. 
So the reality of it is, is that people think that these vaccines are mandated nationally, right? They've taken a couple of small areas, fanned the flames, California, New York, West Virginia, Tennessee, and they fan the flames, okay, into think that people think that, well, I've heard so much about it, it must be required everywhere. And it's not. There's only four states so far. But if we don't stand up and get involved with vaccine freedom, freedom of choice uh, in Wyoming, it's called Wyoming Health Freedom that we're a part of so that we can educate people. Well, and if you're in California or one of the other states, do your research because do that's, your research. that's where you need to have that robust conversation with your doctor. Yeah. The best doctor in the room is the one sitting in your chair. That's the best doctor. But doctor means educator. It doesn't mean here's the pill for the ill. I'm more qualified to take care of you than you are. That's not what doctor by definition means. It means to teach, it means to educate. You have to educate yourself. You have to get exposed to the research. And if you, and, and it's all out there. It's, there's so much more out there now than there was just 20 years ago. It's amazing that what's available to people. You've got to put forth effort, be patient. And they're right? trying to block some of it. Google has money in the game. Amazon sure. has money in the game, yeah. but you can find it. So even though they're not making it easy for you to search and find what you're looking for, don't give up, keep yeah. going. And I have a huge reference of people that I follow at the end of my first book. So yeah. if you're not finding information that you want, pick up my book and start with those people and ask the yeah. question, what does this guy think about this? Yeah. because he's functional so he's not going to only take a conventional medicine approach he's right. going to give you the whole thing on all sides you know when you've got a when you've got an industry that has a 98,715% increase in autism since 1955 just in one area and that's factual data there's a there's a definition that i use for credibility credibility simply means good results over time now, if you go back the last 60, 75 years of our just that one area, just that one item that modern medicine declares as the best all be all that we have, the actual uh, ripple effect of ill health has gotten worse, not better. So I don't for me, it's not as credible as we're being led to believe. OK, it is credible in certain areas. If I need stitches or a bone set. Right. Or yeah, I need we absolutely have heart. to have a doctor for that. Right. <laughs> So again, it's just expanded into an area that it doesn't have expertise. History has expertise. Um, you know, familial history, science, science-based history uh, has expertise in helping people over chronic illness. And, uh, and so, yes, we have to collaborate. Uh, we have to be a voice. That's why I love your podcast. I love what you're doing. Uh, we need to have uh, more and more people coming together, not, not, you know, segregating. We need to come together and uh, and really be a stronger voice for what people need to know then make your choice if you don't want to take action if you don't want to put forth the effort you don't want yeah, to change that's up to that. you but at least that's be informed yeah, yeah i just interviewed somebody who at 40 had a double bypass and should have had a triple but his heart couldn't handle it and wow. he said people come up to him 40 years old people come up to him all the time and say what was the magic pill that you're still here he said me you, there is no magic pill. It's all about you. Yep. You have to own it. You have to research it. You yep. have to be careful what you're putting in and on your body. And he now has two little babies and is living a great life that he would never have had had he yep. not owned the fact that he had severe heart disease. Yeah. You know, it's interesting uh, what you're touching on was, was uh, Royal Rife, uh, who came up with the Rife Generator and Frequency Modulation for Destruction of Pathology at the Cellular Level, was uh, quoted in the Mayo Clinic uh, newsletter many, many, many years ago. They, they were toasting, the Mayo brothers and him were toasting, and the, the caption reads, to the end of disease as we now know it. And in the article, Dr. Rife said this very specifically, because genetics is 30% expression. The other 70% is diet style and stress. That's on me. Okay. If I'm not making good choices there, then I'm, clearly I'm going to express the genetic right. uh, anomalies, the SNPs, the things that you kind of alluded to. And so he says, there's not an illness that a person can acquire that we can't help them uh, through. 
get better, right? But he goes on to say, but unless they change their diet, lifestyle, and stress, they change their behavior, they will recreate the circumstances that allowed the illness event to take place. Right. Period. Right. So, so symptom suppression is not health. Removal of uh, organs that uh, people are convinced are just leftovers from evolution, wherever that comes from, that we yeah. need. That was one of the things I wanted to ask you from your book. I want you to tell people why gallbladders and appendixes are not throwaway organs. Yeah, you know, the, the, here's the thing. Let's start with the gallbladder. First of all, in this country up until recent, uh, recently, I don't know what the, the, the most recent numbers are in the last 18 months or so, uh, but we were removing gallbladders in America at the rate of 7,000 per day, okay? 7,000 per day. Qualified surgeons that have the skill to open the body up, remove an organ, suture it off, stint it from the liver into the cystic duct, sew them up, and, and keep them alive. Okay, that's a skill. I don't, I don't question that skill. It's an amazing skill, okay? But then they don't have the understanding of how the body actually works to tell that person, oh, by the way, from now on with every meal, you're going to have to supplement some emulsifiers. Uh, some, you know, some ox bile or some, you know, hydrochloric acid, betaine, whatever, you know, you're going to have to get a good quality, broad spectrum digestive aid, or you're going to have bowel problems from now on. You're going to go from loose to sluggish to none to loose. It's just going to kind of be this roller coaster from now on. So they have the, the skills to do all these things that are invasive. They don't have the position, they don't understand how to position that person to actually experience wellness or how to have saved the gallbladder to begin with, uh, which we've done on many occasions. So the gallbladder is the storage pouch for the bile from the liver. And what happens when they put the stent in, the liver's still producing this and it's got nowhere to go. So it just dumps. It's constantly dripping, constantly being put through the digestive tract as an emulsifier, even though there's no food there for it to break down. So it becomes an irritant, okay? Then when they do eat food and they don't have enough of that in there, then the digestive process is faulty and it's faulty from then on. So they must, uh, they must find a good, uh, a good digestive support for every meal uh, to get back to some level of, uh, of, of basic, healthy digestion. And this would be a great time to go find yourself a qualified naturopath yes, because exactly. a conventional doctor is not going to help you. with. They don't know to tell you this. They don't know to tell you that the appendix is not a leftover piece from, again, evolution, that there are certain uh, probiotic influences that it has. It's primarily, a, it's a two, uh, two-fold organ. It primarily supports our immune system, and it also secretes a lubricating, uh, kind of a lubricating fluid that allows the fecal matter in the, after it's uh, come through the uh, ileocecal valve, into that cecum area, kind of a pouch area. It allows it to travel against gravity. It lubricates so that we don't get congested down there. You show me somebody who's lost that and they've lost it because of an inflammatory response, a lack of pre or probiotics, uh, potential infection of some kind, immune challenge of some kind, and or encasement of fecal matter. Those are the top four reasons why we lose an appendix and it gets pressure. It's a very delicate organ, very small, and it will burst, but if it bursts, you get peritonitis, I think it's peritonitis, an infection in the gut that'll kill you. Yeah, I had all that. They had, I have a scar this long and this fat because they had to open me up a second time because I was loaded with stuff after they yep. removed my appendix. Yep. And I will give you a side note. One of the things, if you haven't been doing it or have done it in the past, light therapy and wheat germ oil topically on that scar for about 60 days and you'll be amazed at what it'll do for your health my husband just went from reading your book and bought wheat germ oil <laughs> it came yesterday see you had to, you influenced us i oh. loved it that i was learning all kinds of stuff i did not know and oh. john made the same comment so he's my that partner my in heart crime heart. yeah i know it was great let's talk about poop Nobody ever wants to talk about poop, but poop is so important. When I'm speaking to people and I go, let's talk about poop, they all look at me like, what the heck? You're going to talk about poop? Yeah, poop's important. There were two things that stood out to me from your book. Number one, you should be pooping within an hour of eating a meal. 
I don't know that anybody <laughs> that's eating the standard American diet has ever done that. No. Uh, and the problem is, and you mentioned earlier, when you go online and you try to, you know, people that try to do some research, there's two places they go, YouTube and Google, right? Mm -hmm. Google will tell you that if you have a bowel movement once or twice a day to once or twice a week, you're fine. I'm going to mention some names of practitioners from history. It kind of dates me a little bit. The guys that I looked back at mentors from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Bernard Jensen, V.E. Irons, Paul Braggs. Um, Paul Braggs had a student that uh, most people have heard of in this country. They'll know the name Jack LaLanne. Oh, God, yeah. yes. Okay. My mother yeah. did exercises with him every morning. He was the first guy to do on television exercising in, in America. It was amazing. Jack LaLanne was Paul Braggs' number one student. Okay? Is he Braggs of the um, vinegar fame? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Paul Braggs was a naturopath. He died at 96 surfing with a full head of hair with his 18-year-old girlfriend who used to be Ellie Mae Clampett on the Beverly Hillbillies. So, uh, you know, you folks that want to perform really well into your later years, pay attention. Which, but trust he, me, is important to every man listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> he was, uh, so, so those are the people that I was most influenced by, especially my father who helped put me on this path. Um, but then he exposed me to these turn of the century clinical nutritionists, uh, PhD in nutrition uh, level. Uh, they were chiropractors, naturopaths. Um, they did a lot of, of whole food, whole food concentrate lifestyle, like what you do. Like Paul Braggs was huge on lifestyle, okay? And he taught a lot about it. And one of the things that he said uh, is that the average person, if you wanna maintain optimum health, should have between three and five bowel movements a day. You should have one for every meal, one first thing in the morning and one before you go to bed. Now that was his standard. I'm not even that, right? Three a day, right as rank, okay? But I, that, that's just not, you know, um, and I, at 55, to be 56 years old this year, no over-the-counter prescription medications, okay, of any kind at all. And according to statistics, I should be on between three and five medications. You should be on between three and five medications right now. And just because they tell you that does not mean it's true. Number yes. one, there is no magic pill. I'm gonna, I am turn 72 next week. Everybody my age expects to be on the magic pill. They keep looking for the magic pill. It doesn't yes. exist. No, to me, the magic pill is higher. food and, and health and nutrition. Yep. So, but we have not gotten that into our noggins. No. And it is not normal to be ill as we grow older. Um, right. The blue, I actually included a chapter in both books on the Blue Zone Project, which is the National Geographic Project, where they yeah. looked at the people who live the longest in the world and they identified five areas and then they came down to the 10 things those areas had in common. And why is it important to pay attention to the Blue Zone Project conclusions? Because those people live into old age without disease and they get to keep their cognizance. Yep. Now, I don't know about you, yep. but being 72, I'd really like to keep my brain. Yep. I Absolutely. don't want to lose it as I grow older. My mother got dementia. She had sundowner syndrome. She had all kinds of issues. I don't want to go there. So that's motivation enough for me, let alone the fact that I no longer have pain from autoimmune disease. But if you own it, don't accept that that's the norm because it's yes. not. And when you're looking no. on Google at something like how often should you poop, they're telling you what the average is of people out there. It doesn't mean that that's optimal health. All no. of your test results that you're getting back from your conventional doctor are giving you averages. If you're yep. falling in the average range, then, oh my, aren't you healthy? You're not necessarily healthy at all. Right. That's absolutely right. You know, they've been groomed into thinking the number matters, right? The number matters. One Tony over 80, right? That matters, right? Um, I know one person's 142 over, uh, over uh, 86, and they're just as healthy as they can be, right? So it, they, they suffer from numberosis, I call it, right? That, that's the real problem. And people have been you know, led to believe, as we mentioned earlier, that the thing is the problem. I have headaches. I can't sleep. I have allergies. No, you have a body that cannot perform optimally 
based on the circumstances you've created for it. And there's so, reasons that you're having those problems. There's a yeah. core cause. Yeah, blind spots and neglects. <laughs> your, your encouragement of getting the research done helps with the blind spots. But then we also have to develop up a personal responsibility and take care of the neglects. Um, it's been a fascinating thing to witness with, with, with people and masks and things of that nature and, 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 and watching behavior, right? And, and, and this is not a jab, but it's just an observation, okay? Mm -hmm. A person who's clearly 80 pounds overweight, has a pack of cigarettes in their pocket, and is in the drive through getting McDonald's wearing a mask. What, what, at, at what level, on what, you know, there's no, I can't even put it into words. I can't even put it into words how unfortunately influenced people are in that they, they buy into these things that have no proof or longevity, no back history of, of being healthy whatsoever. Yet the behavior, it's simple, it's convenient, it's cheap, right? So they're, they're getting a convenient, cheap, uh, quick life because of it, right? Well, and my biggest challenge when somebody hires me is getting them to eat all the colors of the rainbow and eating them organic and cooking. But I am learning yep. that yep. it sort of trickles slowly into their brain. And all yep. of a sudden, da da, they get it. Yep. And they then when they get it, then they start to feel good and their body starts to celebrate. And from there on in, it's just helping them with tips to make it happen. But getting them over that first threshold of no, you're not gonna eat fast food, it's all chemicals. Yeah. No, you're not gonna eat processed food because most of it, is, if you can't pronounce it or you don't know what it is, do not put it in your mouth that's because right. it's poisoning you. But to get them to give that stuff up because that's convenience. Even though it takes me less time to go into the kitchen and cook a meal than it would take me to get in the car and go buy fast food. Yeah. So it's yeah, not we, really just about time. Yeah, we're we're a victim. We're a victim of convenience. You know, we have a very modern living is exceptionally convenient, but it's also exceptionally unhealthy. Um, and then there's a trade-off for everything that we do or don't do. That's just laws of the universe, right? That's nothing that I've come up with, you've come up with. It's just we understand and we try to live by them. Um, you're gonna give up something for something else when every time you make a faulty decision. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's amazing to me. I have a, a, one of my clients from Nebraska is a nurse. And she'd been with me for about six months and she'd make an okay results, but didn't really understand the diet thing as well as I had hoped early on until her daughter became a practitioner here recently. And then all of a sudden, like you said, voila, the light bulb went off and now she's just singing the praises of, yeah, you know what, you're right. I don't have this anymore and I don't have that and I don't experience this and my mental clarity is better and my decision, my stamina, you're right. So it took- But it you took also have family. to stop and realize that's happening to your body because the whole time I was getting sick, the universe was trying to tell me I was getting sick, but it yes. was going past my brain so quick, I didn't stop to listen to it yeah. until it hit me with the two by four over the head and I had no choice. But yep. when you start to feel good, you also have to pay attention to that. I ask myself every morning when I look in the mirror, how do you feel today? Yep. And if anything is off, I adjust immediately. Yeah. I'll think back, what did I eat yesterday? Did I eat enough greens? Did I eat enough of all the different colors? Why am I not feeling good today? Do I need to release my stress better? Do I need to get out into nature to improve my mood? But I ask every day because I am never going down that chute again of being sick. But you have to pay attention to both how good you feel. And I think most people feel lousy, but they don't know it because they don't pay attention. Well, they've been that, in that condition for so long that if that they feel like that's their normal, right? Yeah. It's amazing what people will be, can become used to, right? I mean, look at our country. It's amazing what we can become. Oh, that's just the way it is, right? Uh, thinking that there's nothing that can be done or nothing that we can change. And there's always room for improvement. There's always room for learning. And there's always room for exercising your freedom of choice to take better care of yourself. Now, does it take effort? Yes. Do you have to be patient? Yes. Does it take time? Yes. Is it worth it? 
most definitely. Well, and you didn't get in that situation overnight. So you have to give your body a chance to catch up with what changes you're making that are healthier. Sure. You can't just expect to wave the magic wand and okay, today I'm going to feel good because it doesn't work that way. You have to put right. the work in and you have to have the patience and it will happen, yeah. but you have to own it. If I yeah. could get everybody to do one thing, it's own your own health and then find the right practitioner for you. You know, the practitioner's responsibility is to go on a journey with their client. And let's say you're leaving Seattle, Washington, and you want to arrive somewhere on the, the East Coast near Pennsylvania. What you have to have is you have to have indicators along the way that you're on the right track, right? You're the willing uh, participant client. I'm the GPS, right? I know how to get there because I've been there and back several, several times with many, many people. And I know what to look for. I kind of help you with the ruts. I understand the bad weather. I understand the mindset. We have all these tools that we can share with you at our experience. And But if the client doesn't see road signs along the way that they're improving, like ways of monitoring that, then that's easy to get discouraged. So we tell people, because this is our clinical experience, right, our practice experience, it takes three to six months to get stable, and it takes one to three years to get well. Three to six months stable in their mind is that they're 90% symptom free, okay? That's how we define it. But I don't want you to be confused. But just because you don't have a symptom doesn't mean you're healthy, okay? Right. So and just three... because you're thin doesn't mean you're healthy. That's the That's other right. one I come across all the time. That's right. So it take, now, now on that journey, if it's three to six months to get stable and one to three years to get you well, let's see how you're responding, however, in the next five to seven days. So now it's more bite-sized and palatable for them to take a small bite of time and say, yeah, I'll chew on that. I'll, I'll give that, you know, that five to seven days. I'll see if I feel maybe a little better energy or a little better sleep or a little less pain or whatever based on what they're telling me. And then you gradually, because you're helping them be aware of those, those simple improvements, they stay on the path long enough to get to where they want to go. And, and that's an education uh, that's an education, uh, you, proper use of language as a practitioner to position them to experience ultimate success. We have a 90% success rate in every case we accept. We do not accept every case. We have a pretty interesting intake process. Um, we do 30 minutes worth of video or, or in classroom education for attending the video or the classroom. They get their first two visits complimentary, no fees whatsoever. We want to make absolutely certain that we are a great match for each other. I'm a great match for them. They're a great match for me. That what we're talking about makes sense. And they're pre-educated on everything I just said. They know in the first 30 minutes, it's going to take three to six months to get stable or one to three years to get well. It's, here's what the investment of time and money could be. Okay, You're going to know that going in. We're going to see every week for the first four weeks minimum for 15 minutes twice the national average that you mentioned earlier. Right, the six minute, the famous six minute appointment. Yeah, twice the national average. Uh, and we're gonna, we're gonna cover 10 specific areas. We're gonna ask about 78 different questions of the body uh, through a neurological exam that's non-invasive, but it's as accurate as a polygraph. And we're gonna figure out what it is that we need to do together to identify your blind spots and your neglects and develop a personal plan for you. It's called structured flexibility. The structure never changes. It hasn't changed in my office in 14 years. The structure of our delivery of care hasn't changed, not one syllable. But the flexibility within that allows me to say, well, if you got 20 people that have you know, hives, you could have 20 different reasons for right. the hive. You don't need Benadryl, everybody, right? Actually, Benadryl is hurting your brain. Yes. It's causing dementia. That was, I, I had an allergy or a sensitivity to every single hay fever medication. So I ended up on Benadryl until yep. I read that it was going to cause dementia long term. Yep. Yep. And what people have who have been told that they're having allergy responses, what they really have is a liver problem. It's the liver every time. That makes, what I use for it now is Quisertin, which is a natural herbal that has, it's a pill that gives gifts. It's great yes. for my liver. 
It's great yep. for my kidneys. It's great yep. for my gut. And it's great for my brain. And it does a better job with hay fever than any other pharmaceutical <laughs> I ever took. So, hey, what's yeah. not to love about it? You know, it's interesting you mentioned that. 37 different drugs right now that different pharmaceutical companies have patents on found their origins in botanicals. Oh, most of, even aspirin. Yep. I don't think people know that. Right. The white willow bark, uh, they did the extraction and was able to patent an extracted chemical form of something. Uh, you can't patent white willow bark. Nature already owns the patent on that. <laughs> Well, and I always love there is no aspirin better than Bayer. There's also yeah. no aspirin worse than Bayer. Yeah, it's right. all the same formula. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's a fulfilling, amazing, wonderful journey. Um, you know, this week alone, we saw uh, close to 140 visits in three, uh, four days. Um, the people coming through from all over the, all over the place. And it's, you know, it's, it's become a, a tremendous fulfilling blessing to be a part of these people's lives and watch, as you said earlier, the aha moments, right? Watch the light bulbs come on when they realize how fun, simple, easy, magical it can be. If they'll just take a little responsibility for themselves, take, you know, realize that at the end of their fork is where the health begins and, and learn labels, learn about toxins. They don't have to become a master or, you know, a PhD in this stuff, but just there's a half a dozen things, literally. There's about a half a dozen things that if they'll practice consistently uh, for themselves and their family, that'll help them avoid 80% of the illnesses out there and or possibly correct uh, anything they might be suffering from right now. There's like a half a dozen things. Yeah, it's really, the longer I'm doing this, I am now five years out of, of coaching school and uh, 12 years into having autoimmune disease. <clears throat> It's becoming simpler and simpler, but I have to be careful because since yep. it's become simpler to me, doesn't mean that the yep. people that I'm working with or talking to are going to find, because I didn't know any of it when I got sick, none of it. Right. And right. so every day was like, uh, oh my God, oh my God. But I have to, I try to bring it down to really simple pieces yep. because it's not really complicated. Right. It's easy to own your own health and improve the quality of it. Right. There are some, um, and it, uh, uh, certainly if there's a imbalance in the body, I can't do that and someone like you can. But if they just start with where I want them to start and then go for fine tuning with someone like you, they would be amazed at yeah. how much better the quality of their life would be. And if, honey, if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. That's so true, you know, and, and a very wise man once said that if it's simple to do, it's simple not to do. If mm -hmm. it's easy to do, it's easy not to do. You know, if an apple a day keeps the doctor away, what a simple thing to do. But most people won't eat an apple a day. It's easy not to do, right? So you and I have a, a, a joyful obligation to share with others openly, what we know to be true and help them get on a path that we know will give them what the results they're looking for. It's all based on the, you know, our audience today, the language that we use and the behavior that we hope they produce. They have to, they have to be willing to join us on that journey. And, uh, and I know with certainty, they'll be glad they did. We, we, we get, you know, our, we just did our, you know, Christmas cards last month, right? And, 680 active clients right now, 260 of them have been with me for more than 10 years. That says and we, a lot. And on average of about 4,000 office visits a year and I work part-time. So there's the need for what we do is more desperately, uh, the, the timing is now more than ever, okay, for what we do. And practitioners who are struggling, who don't know, you know, they want to have an impact on their communities. They want to develop a, a, a relationship and, a, and, a, and, and, you know, have a business because businesses have bills. Okay. We all have bills, right? And you can't make it about the money, but if you don't have some level of prosperity around the value, the amazing value that you provide to the community that I provide, well, then that's not right either. Okay. We have no, to have And people don't appreciate it if they don't pay for it. 
I learned yeah. that when I had my own business and employees. When I gave them health insurance, they did not appreciate it anywhere near as much as when they paid a <laughs> small amount for it because yep. then they had skin in the game. It's yep. a weird thing about the way the American mind or the human mind works. Yeah, but yeah, good. no, they've got to have some skin in the game or they yep. don't value it. Yep. You know, the key to it is, is in the three things that I know that most people are looking for. They want accessibility, they want affordability, but most importantly, they want results, okay? Those are the three elements that must be in any practice, regardless of what you're doing. I have to be accessible, I have to be affordable, and I have to know how to get people results. If they'll comply, right? It's a mutual thing. They have right. to do their part. Um, and, uh, and, and so we're just very fortunate, we're very blessed you know, that, uh, that we've been able to do it for as long as we have. My, my father started the clinic in 98 in Torrington, about uh, an hour and 10 minutes north of here. Uh, I've been in Cheyenne since November 1st, 2001. Um, and when I started, it was my mom, dad, and me. And, and now we've got 10 of us running around here with a full-blown manufacturing facility uh, that we adhere to the FDA guidelines for good manufacturing practices. Um, you know, there's two or three people that work over there. Uh, we got five, six people to work over in the, you know, the, the practice side of things. And, and, and this is just a part-time, this is just a really a part-time thing. I mean, four days a week, um, three days a week, three day weekends every week. And, and uh, once a quarter, get to take a week off. And, and, and I know from my experience that practitioners, if there's any practitioners typically in your audience, I know with certainty that there's those out there that would love to, and I'm not talking about huge dollars, but there's people out there that would love to have an extra five to 1500 a month, five to 1500 a week, or maybe five to 1500 a day. And the amount is not the issue. The issue is, do you have the right audience language and behavior in place to deliver, to deliver that to your community? And the only difference between those numbers and when we receive them is effort. That's it. That's the only difference. And so when 2008 rolled around, and we realized, you know, that, you know, we've been in, I've been in clinical practice by that time, seven years. Um, we had uh, become a, a top rated 3% business model in the country at that time and have maintained that ever since. I realized that there's a lot of people that might be willing to tap into, need to tap into, uh, have a burning desire to tap into our, our administrative side, our business philosophical side, right? How do you deliver that kind of care to that many people? Uh, and do it efficiently, affordably, effectively? How do you monitor that? How do you attract them to begin with, right? And, and we, we captured that. A, a gal followed me around for two years in the exam room and she pieced all that. She just captured all the questions, all the things, the nuance, right? The energy of being in uh, practice with helping people at this stuff. And, uh, and she captured all that. We put into practice blueprint in 2008, and now we've been able to work with, with students and practitioners uh, around the country to help them implement, to see where are their blind spots and where are their neglects in the area of their business model and how they're having that, that joyful obligation, that impact that they love to see people get healthy, they love to see people get well, but they thought, well, all I gotta do is run an ad, put a shingle out, get me a website, I'm in business. And they're going to beat my door down and to come and see me. And it doesn't happen that way at all. There are some specific leadership skills in that area that practitioners have to develop, have to be willing to develop no different than our clients. You and I as clients have to be willing to develop new skills in the area of personal care, right? It's no different. Um, what that looks like is, is, you know, specific to the person, but, but uh, in, in a nutshell, they have to be willing to develop certain skills uh, in order to, uh, to fulfill the practice that they're looking for. And so we branched into that. We do shadow days now. We've got practitioners that come in from all over the country and follow me around for a day and just see what's possible, uh, which is a lot of fun. Uh, 15th and 16th of January, we got practitioner weekend. We got practitioners coming in. Uh, one from, uh, we got one flying in from California to spend the weekend with us to really get exposed to and immersed in what is practice look like so I can take that headache off and I can focus on what I love you get to focus on what you love which is to see sick people get well 
right. to get That's what we all want to do. Yeah. So, so we branched off into that about 12 years ago, and it's been a, it's been a wonderful complementing journey to the one that we get to embrace with our clients every day and their health. Uh, we now get to see practitioners become very healthy in their business life. And, and that's also been an additional reward. So you're in Wyoming, but somebody yep. listening to this might be able to find one of the practitioners that you've trained in yes. their local area. Because yes. that was going to be one of my questions. You know, I'm in Los yeah. Angeles, so I can't be flying every other week to Wyoming right. sure. to get in my program. Right. So um, there's a whole lot of things we haven't <laughs> talked about, and we're running out of time. And I don't want to interrupt right. your yeah. day too much, since I'm very grateful that you started yeah. at the crack of dawn with me. But <laughs> I'd like to have you come back, because there are some things I still would like to talk about. You do Please. unique testing that most people probably have never heard of. You yes. do um, the muscle testing and the uh -huh. reading of the eye, which I'm not going to try to pronounce because I probably would do it wrong, but you hair analysis. Yes. You do not take blood and no. then figure out what pill matches it. You do a whole series of tests yes. on your clients before they hire you so yes. that you know what their health condition is and it's from a unique perspective that is distinctly a naturopath, I think. Yeah. So I, I want to talk about that. I loved okay. your six to one food plan, which we haven't yeah. had a chance to go into. Yeah. Um, there are just lots of things. The whole thing about the digestive system was yeah. the best explanation I have ever read on how well, our thanks. bodies work. So yeah. I want to have you back so that you can explain that to my listeners as well. And yeah. then um, you do a lot of supplementation with really high quality supplements. Yes. So I would like to talk about that a little bit so that people can learn okay. from that. Absolutely. Everything has a quality that matters. I take a lot of supplements. I only use them from high quality supplement companies. You have developed your own, but they're high quality supplements. Just going to the drugstore and buying something off the shelf that has a soy base is not going to be the same as taking a high quality supplement and yeah. food quality matters. So yes. you have to, you're worth it. You're worth the, and it's not necessarily that much more money, but you're worth the high quality version of whatever that is. So I That's want you to come back and help me explain that to everybody. I would well. love to, Cheryl. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to doing this again. Now, we talked about what I'm going to do under this podcast is I'm going to yes. list your phone number so yes. that people can find you because yes. you might be able to help them long distance or um, I live in Arcadia next to Pasadena. I understand you have a practitioner in Pasadena that could help me with supplementation if I wanted it. So there are people all around yes. the country that you have touched that you have trained that can help our listeners no matter where they are. So I want them to be able to get a hold of you. Yeah, the best thing to do to keep it real simple, uh, text me 307-631-5300. That's my direct cell number. Just identify that you heard about uh, heard our, our interview today and that's how you got my number. Uh, and uh, 307-631-5300. So that's the best way Just send me a quick text message. I can. Uh, uh, get you lined out, maybe either with us helping you or finding someone in your area that can uh, can monitor your case for you. And if you're somebody who's been searching for a practitioner who can help them and you're frustrated because you've been to 8 billion people and nobody is getting you there, start with Dr. Dan because he has a perspective that could very well be the missing key and the missing puzzle piece to your health. Thank you, Cheryl. So thank you so much. I have loved it. This has flown by and I have I loved know. our conversation. So thank you. And we'll schedule sometime in the spring when you can come back because I want to hear more about yes. how often I should be pooping and how I should be eating better and food combining, which yes. I never really understood before. Yeah, we'll do it again real soon, I promise. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Have a wonderful January and Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Bye-bye.